Thank you all for coming. Um, so first, I want to say that I am not the only person here who represents Transit Talk. I'll talk a little bit later in this presentation about just how many people have contributed to this project over the last three years here at Chi Hack Night. But first, I want to point out some people who are down here in the corner who have contributed significantly either at the beginnings of the project or throughout the time that it's been active. Um, we have here today Scott, Megan, Adam, Tomer, and then right in the center here, Victor Kovez, our original lead developer, who is back primarily to cheer me on. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Victor. So Transit Talk, as I say every week here at Shy Hack Night, if you come here to Shy Hack Night every week, is a crowdsourced issue reporting platform for public transit. And before we go into detail about exactly what that means and how Transit Talk functions, I want to talk about the background of transit issue reporting in Chicago in general, because this is the community that we built this in. This is kind of our context for coming into this with. So Chicago is well known in the US and around the world for having a very active and foundational civic tech community. That's all of you right here. That's Code for Chicago. That's Smart Chicago Collaborative, which is now City Tech Collaborative. That's a bunch of organizations and a bunch of people who have all tried to use technology to enhance the public good in some way. Now, about a decade ago, some folks who some of their names you may know, especially if there are some Braintree folks in the audience, one of them is Harper Reed who was the CTO of the Obama re-election campaign and later a, a big wig at Braintree and is now doing something else. Um, and Dan X O'Neill, who is executive director of Smart Chicago Collaborative and is now also doing something else, um, they put together what was called CTA Alerts. CTA Alerts integrated official notifications from the CTA of issues that were happening, like elevator outages, for instance. Um, with an online message board where people could come together and post when something was happening that maybe wasn't contained in an official alert from the CTA. Eventually, something really interesting happened with CTA alerts. This message board started getting members who were CTA staff and who would share sort of inside information about what was happening in a system even when what was happening wasn't sort of severe enough or delay-inducing enough to create an official notification from the CTA. Eventually, CTA alerts also expanded to Twitter when Twitter first blew up around, again, 2009, and maintained a bunch of Twitter accounts for each of the different train lines in the city. Um, and those Twitter accounts would basically, they'd retweet stuff that was tweeted at them. This was kind of naive early days of Twitter, so not much spam showed up there. Um, and then also, they would show all of the automated alerts for each of these lines. But the idea was, it was a little more structured than just like somebody shouting into the void about something happening on a transit system. It was something that contained information about a specific line and could be in some way actionable for somebody. With that, background and also with an understanding of the CTA's own sort of issue reporting systems and issue communication systems, that's where we sort of came in and we thought, how can we improve on that? So let's talk about issue reporting for the CTA. Um, basically, there are a couple of ways that you can communicate with the CTA and say, something happened on my ride and I, I don't know, I want to address a grievance or I just want to like have somebody know that something happened or maybe there's something that can be done about it. You can send the CTA an email, you can give them a call. Um, these are all sort of antiquated ways of doing this, some would say, but one thing that's really interesting about it is that the CTA doesn't really widely communicate or at least it's not very widely known that some of the most actionable information that somebody can give the CTA is something like a vehicle number or a vehicle operator badge number. These kinds of things that people, when they're describing something that happened to them on a transit trip, on their commute, it doesn't immediately come to mind as something that you're going to save for later and say, this is what happened to me and, oh, here's the vehicle number. So there's a little bit of a disconnect in, in reporting to the agency directly as well. Um, that'll come back into play a little bit later. Let's talk about 
what we did with Transit Talk, though. So Transit Talk was first formed a number of years ago here at Shy Hack Night. Well, it, it started as a hackathon project. I'll talk about that history in a second. But basically what we wanted to do was build on these current tools and, and fill in gaps. We wanted to provide sort of a more structured platform besides that, that Twitter void or that Facebook void or wherever you might go and yell about something that happened on your commute. And we wanted this platform that we were building to be usable and useful for people in their daily commute in real time so that they could check on like, here's the stop I'm going to. Is there anything that's happening here that I should be aware of right now? That kind of thing. We wanted issue reporting to also be a little more granular than what transit agencies themselves typically share. This goes back to that idea of the CTA alerts platform wasn't just a platform or a website that shared information from the CTA, but was also a message board where people would talk about things that were happening on their own commute. And those things may not be things that an agency would naturally communicate about actively. It could be things like on this particular bus, on this particular run, both of the bike racks are filled up or both of the spots for wheelchairs are filled up. And that kind of thing is very hard to A, detect, and B, smartly communicate if you're a transit agency. You don't want to overwhelm the official CTA Twitter feed with every little tiny granular thing that's going on in a system that would make that information useless. Um, we also gave a lot of thought to some things we didn't want to do when building this platform. And when I show you the demo of the platform later, it'll be clear where there are some things that aren't done. One of those, for instance, that I've talked about before, if you've been at Shy Hack Night before, is we intentionally avoided allowing photo uploads of issues that people are facing. And the reason we did that in this case was to avoid social shaming mechanisms around homelessness, around different things that can, especially when it comes to like reporting civic issues. People who report tend to skew towards different socioeconomic groups. And we really wanted to make sure that we were creating a platform that wasn't going to reinforce as much as we could avoid it, wasn't going to reinforce existing social hierarchies in a harmful way. So what about the mechanics of actually building a thing? So like I said, this started as a project at a hackathon called Hack Illinois. Victor and a friend of his named Robert and a couple of other people went to this hackathon and built something based on uh, a little like custom Google map with some visualizations over it. And it allowed you to report an issue basically through a Google form by saying, I'm at this stop on this line and I'm describing something that's happening to me. And then it would throw up little dots on a map showing here's where all of the issues have been reported. Um, we wanted to create something once this came to Shy Hack Night that wasn't tied to this Google product that had a very limited feature set of like what you could do with Google Maps as your basis for this. Um, we also wanted to make something that had a little bit of a different feature set. And that feature set was informed by sort of a period of, of surveying and I like to say soul searching, mostly because the letter S was in my head a lot when I wrote that. Um, where we basically constructed a survey and gave it to people on platforms, on vehicles of the CTA, where we wanted to learn about just generally their transit experience and their experience with reporting issues on transit. And of course, I'm sure many of you might assume correctly that in most cases, when somebody faces an issue on a transit system, they don't report it in any way. It's not really a natural urge that somebody has, especially when it's something that is granular, like a dirty seat, something along those lines. So we did this really non-leading survey and a lot of user sort of like interviews around that, tried to not lead questions around we're creating an app or we're creating a website or we're doing this or this or this. We wanted to learn how people experience transit issues and try to build something around that experience. Um, we used the insights that we got from that, that period of surveying and that period of soul searching to determine our criteria for our minimum viable product. Now, I have been saying those words, minimum viable product, up here for probably a year and a half. Um, and that comes to this second bullet point right here, volunteer time management or mismanagement. 
You might remember that the very, very first Shy Hack Night of 2019, a year ago, was like a, a project update Shy Hack Night. People came up and talked for five or 10 minutes about their projects, and I came up here and I proudly said, we are going to launch in February. <laughs> Now that same week, that, let this be a lesson, <laughs> that same week I started a job as the third employee of an early stage startup. That ruined our progress for a long time. Um, so make sure if you're going through a project like this one, make sure that if you as an individual are like, taking ownership over the project management of something, that you are A, willing be able and see you've equipped your team to be able to adjust to life situations like that. Um, luckily, I'm not working for that startup anymore. I have a lot more free time. But there was a period where we had sort of like a winter of development. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Um, and it took a long time to like recover from that and get our momentum back. Let's talk about what the app actually is, though, by seeing it. When I say app, I don't mean necessarily a native mobile app that you download for iOS or for Android. And there's, there's a reason for that. We wanted to make sure that we were creating something that was fairly universal first and also relatively simple for us to put together, relatively simple for somebody else to implement. And I'll talk about that in a second. What we've done is we've created Transit Talk in a way where now, Transit Talk is a mobile-first website. It can be sandboxed into a mobile app. But the way that we've created this is it's not a single platform where you go and then it fetches your location and gives you information about your local transit authority. It's built modularly. It's built to be implemented for like local transit systems and individual cities on a case-by-case -case basis because every place is unique. And we largely built this with a lot of assumptions around the CTA and a lot of assumptions about how transit in Chicago works. And a lot of that is built into the app, but we built it in such a way where somebody can extend the functionality of this app or somebody can give it a different name and a different color scheme really easily. And we built a bunch of documentation as well around this to make sure that instead of just being like an issue reporting system for the CTA, or instead of being an attempt at a universal issue reporting system that'll tell you when you're in Omaha or in NYC or in Beijing what system you're riding, we want to make sure that we can hand this off to different people in different places to implement with their own local expertise. Because that's what's really going to make this an effective system. Let me give you a brief tour of our Chicago-based demo. This is our home page. And I should probably bring up my notes for the demo over here. OK, this is our home page. You can see it's lovely. You can choose while browsing your phone to tap to report an issue on a bus or on a train, or you can view current issues that are near your location. Uh, I should note that location permissions aren't like forced upon you. It's something that's asked of you when you open this. I just had this open already. So, you can see sort of some nearby stations. Um, you can see as well that there's a little bit of a mismatch in exactly how nearby is defined. That's kind of a troublesome part of, of the way that station information is stored. Um, but anyways, you can see the number of issues reported at that station. If you go to that issue, you can read a description of that, though this font should be darker. Later. Yeah. Later. There's some tweaks we're still making. Let me show you. Oops. I got it, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> so let me show you how to create an issue report. So let's say we're at the Merchandise Mart, brown line, purple line, and we want to create an issue report. We're brought to this page. It autofills the line and the stop. And then part of that long section of surveying and soul searching we did was to determine sort of a, a, 
a breakdown of the types of issues that people face in their daily commute on public transit. We didn't want to go in with the assumptions that like the folks we talk to and the folks we build with at Shy Hack Night each week had the same kinds of public transit related issues or the same frequency of different kinds of public transit related issues as the general transit riding population of Chicago. So when we came up with these six categories, which are delays, cleanliness, crowding, safety, accessibility, staff, and then the seventh other, because you never know what's gonna happen. Um, that came from talking to people outside of this room. It came from talking to people, again, on, on station platforms, on vehicles, and so on, and making sure that what we were making kind of made natural sense to somebody. So anyways, let's say that right now there's crowding on the platform. There certainly was when I came in. We can enter an optional free text description. Crowded. Uh, hopefully, people will do higher quality descriptions than that, because that's trash. And then you submit the issue, and you can see on the same station where other stuff has been reported before. Um, for those of you in the back, it says, the last issue report here 10 hours ago was way too many people on the platform for something called shy hack night causing delays. <laughs> but that's not all this does, because if that was all that did, um, three years would be a long time to come together, wouldn't it? So let's talk about some of the other features. I'm going to head up here to this lovely hamburger menu. This popped out from the left, despite the fact that the hamburger menu is on the right. Again, some things are being tweaked. <laughs> I'm going to log in. Let's see what happens when you log in. All right. This looks familiar, does it not? However, Instead of saying nearby reported issues, we've now got favorite stops. Look at that. Look at that. What a beautiful feature. Wonderful feature, if I do say so myself. Now, please don't use this to triangulate where I live. <laughs> there are much better ways to do that. So let's report an issue here, this time on a bus. So I'm at Lake Park and 48th. I want to head downtown. I've lost my mouse. Here we are. And that's six bus, or in this case, the two bus, because it auto-filled one of the three lines that was there. You can change that. The two bus at that stop has decided to be 15 minutes late, and there's gum on my shoe, and I blame the CTA. <laughs> late bus. Oh no, late bus slash gum. And we submit. And not only does this add to the list of issues at this given stop, but if I head to the top again, and I look over here at this lovely new thing that has appeared, I can see my entire history of issue reporting, which, because we emptied the database this morning, it consists of two issue reports. But when you're logged in, you can see and manage all of the reports that you've created through time. And you could even like create your own personal tracker of, like, here's my experience of the CTA from this information, which I think is cool, because I love data. Um, and that's it for the tour. Uh, we're going to have during our breakout group tonight, everybody is welcome to come in and like try it out for yourselves. We'll give the URL out. We'd love to get some raw feedback on it. Um, I want to go back to the presentation, though, because there's drama that's about to happen in this presentation. <laughs> you won't guess what happened. So in November, this, this thing happened. And I'll read this out for those of you in the back. This is Scott over here, our designer. He says, yo, everyone on this channel needs to check out the Pigeon Public Transit app. And then Tomer says, oh, damn. And then I say, infinite scream. And the reason I infinitely screamed was because there's this lab at Google 
called Area 120. And Area 120 is this lab for experimental products, where Google has this thing called 20% time, and employees are supposed to spend 20% of their time working on side projects. Area 120 makes side projects into full-time gigs for Google employees. And they made something called Pigeon, and they have like 10 full-time employees on it, and it's also way more polished than what we did. <laughs> so where do we go from there? Well, for one thing, uh, Google has a long history of project abandonment. Um, Area 120 especially has a long history of project abandonment. It's actually built to abandon most of its projects. Most of the things that launch through Area 120 are folded just a couple years later. Pigeon, this app that was launched by Google, is also iOS only for now, and it's only in five cities at the moment. So there's a couple of things that we want to do right now that motivate our continuing work. We want to focus on cities that are not covered by Pigeon. We want to connect with civic tech groups in those cities and build this in a community-driven way. Applications that can be customized to the individual needs of those cities and the communities that are served by those cities' transit agencies. Um, this also was a big motivator for us. Uh, Tomer sat us down, and I'm calling it a pep talk, but it felt a lot more negative in the moment. <laughs> um, we discovered we were in a rut. And we had gone on and on and on and on. Like, this is one of the longest running breakout groups at Shy Hack Night, and we hadn't produced our minimum viable product yet. This really energized us because we said the world is going to pass us by unless we make something that's useful, unless we make something that we can launch. And we prioritized like getting our basic features set together, making sure it works, building out our documentation, and then focusing on outreach. So the reason that Transit Talk works the way it does is because of a data standard called GTFS. GTFS is a type of data that stores information about where transit stops are located, the directions that transit lines run, the color and name of each different transit line and station and stuff like that. There's an extension to it that even does scheduling. Um, basically, every major transit system around the world, thousands of them, use GTFS data. And we've built our app in a way where a programmer can switch out one line of code for a different GTFS feed besides like Chicago and immediately have a beautiful functioning transit issue reporting system that they can spin up for their city. And then from there, they have the ability to customize with the backing of our documentation, help from our group and folks who've worked on it. So we've identified 62 cities that meet all three of these particular criteria, 80,000 people or more, readily available GTFS data from their transit agency, and an active civic tech community. So this is like Code for America brigades or things like it. Um, we have a couple of specific cities that are interested in launching right away. Now this, when I say city, it's either a community group in the city or it's the transit agency itself. Um, so one of our old group members lives in Seattle now and is interested in spinning up a, a transit talk instance in Seattle. Um, I know somebody who works in city government in Asheville, and their transit agency is interested in having something like this, especially since it's way cheaper than them contracting to somebody. They just need really like the, the server capacity. Um, and then somebody I used to work with in Miami is interested in working with their local Code for America brigade to spin up a transit talk instance as well there. So that's kind of what we're focused on right now is all of this outreach and making sure that this kind of functionality, even if Google is going and replicating it, that it's able to be implemented in sort of a democratized fashion across a wider range of cities and that people can have access to this sort of potential of issue reporting and be able to report issues on public transit and see those reported issues and improve their daily commutes through that um, without having to rely on Google to come along one day and say, you are worthy. So like I said, we're having a feedback session tonight during the breakout groups. I'll elevator pitch it later. Um, and we also have a Twitter, Transit Talk app. Um, and the URL of our live demo is up there. I'll also share it in the Slack later. But for now, it's time for Q&A, because I think I've already taken like 25 minutes.
So uh, in Chicago, people are taught to think of Metra and CTA as completely different things. And when I saw the train logo that you use the the image that CTA prefers and did not indicate that Metro was part of it. So my initial reaction was that this doesn't cover Metro and South Shore, but I suspect you have an answer for it and it does, and you want people to think differently than they've been trained to think. So that gets to the modularity of the way that we've built this. So uh, the CTA information that we have in the demo app is based on a GTFS feed but you can add more than one feed to one of these apps. So anybody could spin up a version of Transit Talk that is just Metra, or that includes feed uh, every station in Metra, CTA, and Pace, or they could, for some reason, put together the CTA with a random bus line that runs between suburban Indianapolis and the middle of Indianapolis, and a boat that ferries people between different sections of Hamburg if they wanted to. As long as there's GTFS data for it, you can add one feed or combine different feeds into an app that meets the needs of whatever user base you think would get value out of it. So that data does exist for Metra. The same information about stops, the same information about line names, and by doing a little bit of work in the code, we can easily have a version of it that works for Metra. Has there been any partnership with the CTA or, or anything? And if so, what does that look like? And ha have there been any thoughts about um, sort of uh, adding a feature of closing the feedback loop and having um, staff from any of those agencies respond to it? Yeah, definitely. So over the course of these three years, we've had a lot of CTA folks who've come into Shy Hack Night every once in a while. And we have talked with a lot of them as they've come in here. And in a lot of cases, in the specific case of the CTA, it's kind of like the, the individual within the CTA up against the behemoth that is making a decision in the CTA as far as closing the feedback loop um, and, and like integrating this into an official issue reporting system. However, we have in our current like UI mockups for the Chicago version an additional page after the issue reporting page that's like an optional did you get the vehicle number? Did you get the badge number? And those sorts of insights were gained from understanding the kinds of things that are valued by CTA's sort of performance management and, and that kind of staff. Um, additionally, one thing that we're going to do, well, I actually, we're not going to do it because Pigeon exists in Chicago. But when we were going to like really go after this as a launch strategy in Chicago as our first big city, what we were going to do was leverage our Twitter account to talk to the CTA because the CTA is very active on Twitter. And then also take some of the highest priority issue reports that people reported, stuff that's really interesting or stuff that's really, um, really uh, impacts the system but didn't show up in the CTA's own sort of outward warnings or alerts and put those into like an email form so when I was talking to a friend before coming over here about what I was going for and what the presentation is about, an interesting comment from her was that, oh, I hate it when peop during summers, especially when people are coming out of a non-air-conditioned car and they don't tell other people that, don't enter this car, it's not, not air-conditioned, and there should be a way to like tell that you know, without having to talk to someone. <laughs> um, does that seem like a functionality that you have? Because I don't mean by what you, s but by what I see in the live demo, um, the issues are hooked on a spot rather than on a moving vehicle. So that brings up a fantastic sort of segue. Um, there is this universal data standard for station locations. There is not, as of yet, a highly adopted universal data standard for live vehicle tracking. Even within the CTA, there's two different systems. There's a GPS system for the bus and a relay system for the trains. And what we wanted to do in sort of the basic app that we built out was build on what was universal and then allow developers in individual cities to build features like live vehicle tracking that would have to be coded individually for their individual city context. Um, so while it's not in the demo, it's something that we've given a lot of thought to because, of course, a lot of issues move with vehicles. Like, issues aren't just station-based. But this is kind of like the basic scaffolding for something that 
individuals or groups like ours here at Shai Hack Night would build on for something that's more robust for their individual systems. Um, and specifically, at the moment, kind of the closest that you can get to something like that is using the free text description at the end of an issue report to say, hey, car number three has no air conditioning. But then again, you still run up against the issue that unless there's a critical mass of thousands of people using the app at the same time, that issue report is probably not going to travel down the line as the train or the bus travels down the line. What about um, clearing issues? So if someone says, hey, the elevator at Clark and Lake is out and it gets fixed by some miracle uh, <laughs> within 24 hours, and, but then someone looks at the app and then they see, oh, two days ago someone said the elevator was broken, so I'm going to avoid that station. Mm -hmm. So we have, it wasn't in the demo, but because it's, honestly, it looks terrible. But there is an old admin page that we built at one point that allowed admins to clear out issues, but we haven't yet implemented like a crowd clearance. Um, one reason we didn't do that right away was we didn't know exactly how we wanted to combat um, like malicious use of that feature. Um, one of the key sort of inspirations for this on the non-transit side was Waze, the driving app. Waze has sort of crowdsourced issue reporting built into it and crowd clearance of issues as well. And it's something we're definitely interested in and probably a feature coming down the road. I should mention, as questions go on, some of those features that aren't there yet that are highly important are that, live vehicle tracking city by city, a map view, which isn't yet in this version. Um, those are like three of the big ones. Surprised to see um, odor wasn't one of those things that is reported. Because in my experience, well, I guess it's not a consensus there. Pungent orders, especially during the winter, on platforms, elevators, even inside the cars, it happens, you know, uh, homeless, I guess. In our, in our that as well now, as of the 1st of January, there's other smells that happen that aren't offensive to me, but some people find offensive. So I uh, was wondering if that's another free text situation. <laughs> Yeah, in our categorization sort of surveying, we ended up grouping that under cleanliness. But there are a couple of areas where there is some ambiguity in what an issue might be. You bring up a good point there. Another one is like the example of bike racks that I mentioned earlier. If both of the bike racks on a bus are taken, um, there's some folks who we talked to who said the most natural category that I think that's under is accessibility, but that's not necessarily the spirit of the accessibility category. So there's still some like, some tweaking that could happen on those categories. And I think that's also location sensitive as well. We want people to be able to sort of determine their own categories city to city. So we have one question from the doc. It says, could you talk a little bit about your process for developing documentation? <laughs> process, that's a good word. <laughs> our process. Um, our documentation was built in fits and starts. I don't know if Anybody up here would remember like the early stages of documenting? Victor, do you remember some of the early like? He wasn't expecting to speak tonight. I wasn't, but I'm always expecting to speak. To preface this, I will say, um, Soren didn't give me enough credit here. It was a Rails app when I handed it to him. Just a little clarification there. But as for documentation, I think in the original hackathon, we had documentation that was like very thorough about like the quick start of like, given any GTFS, this is how you do it. I think the teams expand on that of like, we have like a resource called um, Transit Land, which is where you can pull a feed from, and you can just say like, this is the URL, this is the steps you follow to spin up an instance. So there's the process. I think was just essentially like trying to imagine. If I'm a fairly savvy developer of a certain organization, how can I find the feed that I care about and punch in there? But I think there was a strict process. And I wasn't going to share this tonight, but we also, uh, in terms of non-technical documentation, we have a um, marketing website that's not totally complete. There's, you don't have to show that. Right? I know, Scott. <laughs> I know you want to restyle it, but I want to show that we were at least thinking about it. Um, in terms of like talking about what this is, 
to an audience outside of a developer's audience. Like if somebody knew that there was a tech community, a civic tech community in their city, or they wanted to push a local, local city council member to push the transit agency locally to implement something like this, we have a marketing website that summarizes sort of what it's all about, what it's supposed to do, and includes some links that developers can then follow to resources about how to spin up an instance of their own. Hi, hey, um, where are you hosting this and how are you paying for hosting? This is right now hosted on a Heroku instance that's really, really cheap. Um, I pay $10 a month, but the downside of that is it's like a Heroku instance that sleeps when you're not using it. So it has a cold start problem. Um, if you load the app after it hasn't been used for a while, it takes a few seconds to load um, because we're only billed for the time we're using instead of having dedicated capacity. Um, it can be, uh, we provide some guides for, for deploying on different, um, I think just Heroku in the docs, but it, we're hosting it on Heroku. Basically anything that can host a, a Rails app is fine for this, it's Ruby on Rails. And I'm monopolized on the time of my team. I, I do really want to thank everybody who contributed. I didn't say the statistics earlier, and I want to say it now. Um, we had, well, where is it? Um, 26 developers, and more than 173 people joined our Slack channel over the course of the last three years. There have been a lot of people who have provided input or provided a direct contribution in some way. So thank you to all of you who dropped by for one time, said please implement this, and then never visited again. Because even though that was probably frustrating for us, it was also very valuable in understanding what people wanted out of something like this. So thank you.